Hello and welcome to the show, the Phil Hayes Show, brought to you by The Athletic and The Square Ball. I'm Dan Moylan from The Square Ball, is Michael Normanton. Hello. And the big dog, Phil Hay. Hello. Uh, time to subscribe to The Athletic right now so you can read everything Phil is writing. What's on there at the minute? We have uh, another piece on Rodrigo and his false nine performance on Saturday, which I thought in part was very, very good. Uh, we've got a piece on paternity leave as well uh, after Dan James and his ride on his chopper down to London from Manchester in time for the Fulham game um, and also and this is pretty interesting we've surveyed a really wide group of agents um, asking them what the best deal of the window was what the worst deal was um, their thoughts on the transfer market generally and, and a whole load of other issues um, so yeah have a look at those 33% off the price of a full sub at the minute at theathletic.com forward slash leads pod reflections on the last seven days then Phil, um, another defeat for Leeds. Yes, uh, you wanted to hit me with a WhatsApp message from Saturday, didn't you? So, do you know what? Let's do it. Yeah, I mean, what's the point of doing this if I can't chuck you under the bus for this? Um, Messaging me at half-time saying Leeds would win this. Yes, I might have done. Although, I was just looking back at the messages just um, for a bit of um, mitigation, and I did say, mind you, let's reconvene in 45 minutes. Um, To which you said to me, are you Normanton in disguise? (laughs) Followed by, in brackets, let's actually get there first. (laughs) Followed by 20 minutes later, for f**k's sake. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would have done as a match report, to be quite honest, for um, for Saturday, because that was pretty much how it went. Yeah, who do I send my invoice to, yeah. uh, etc. Do you think it was our best performance of the season, even though we lost? It definitely was in the first half. That That is, by some distance, I think, the closest we've had to Bielsa Bowl at any stage this season. It was coming in the first half at Newcastle, but it wasn't quite as tight and, and as... I guess as as aggressive and as as well structured as it was in the first half, there were big chances for West Ham, and I think if if those two early chances that Melier saved had gone in, then it would have been a really long and potentially horrible afternoon. But from that point on, you you saw the way in which Leeds you saw basically how Leeds play at their best, which is loads of rotation, loads of movement. Rodrigo had a different sort of performance to Bamford. There were similar aspects to it, but his positioning coming deep to halfway was was far more pronounced and, and he became really difficult for West Ham to pick up before half-time. They didn't know what to do with him and because of that, there were loads of angles to play at. There were loads of space spaces and gaps to run into. Rafinha looked very much on it, despite the fact that he was nowhere near fully fit. And I did feel at half-time like they had West Ham exactly where they wanted them. And, and more to the point, it looked to me that even though chances were coming for West Ham, they didn't, they hadn't really got to the point of of working leads out, of, of knowing what they were going to do, uh, and I think that's why, come the end of the game, it felt like a, a result that was more goaling than any other this season because it really was there on a plate. What do you make of Furpo so far? It was probably his best performance against West Ham, but then there were also points where he was massively out of position too. Well, the first goal, particularly, uh, although. In those circumstances where you're man marking and you're pursuing somebody over the field, over the pitch, that's where the whole thing needs to work, and somebody needs to cover for you, and everybody needs to go with their man. And as we saw quite a lot at set pieces and particularly corners last season, if you lose players in a man man marking system, you're in trouble straight away. You know, the gaps open up, and I know there was the flick off football for the goal, the, the deflection, but you know, once Boeing got into that area, it was always likely that that Leeds were going to concede. I was thinking about Filippo the other day because I sort of wonder what it must be like to join a squad where the tactics are so definitive, you know, and are so so pronounced and, and so strict, but also where so many of the players have played that way for such a long time. You know, if you go through the team from front to back, even Millie now has been here for... Um, a good couple of years. Most Since of, he was 16, um, uh, uh, according yeah, to Michael no, Owen, no, when, he, when he was in, in yeah, the, uh, yeah. the youth system there. I, I missed him um, at that age, <laughs> and I've, I've been beating myself up for the past few days about it, yeah. Um, and, and incidentally, we know he's not. Uh, he wasn't here at 16, because at 16 he was learning how to box other keepers over at Lorient, as you do. But even he knows how Leeds play. So if you join this, you know, if you join this squad fresh, you... You can go right from front to back, Cooper, Dallas, Ailing, Cleek, um, all of these players, Bamford, who, when you go out to train, know exactly what they're doing uh, and know instinctively where they should be and where they should go. If you haven't done that and, and you're new to it all, it must be quite a learning curve. Mm. Um, I think regardless of, of who you are, because of the way Bielsa works and because of how intense it is and, and you know how, how rigid he is about his tactics... It's not that easy to feel your, your way in. And, and I've felt with Furpo so far that going forward, I can see good aspects in his game. 
defensively, I don't think it's been there really. No, are you worried? Um, I, look, I, I don't think the, the the problem with this team so far is that Filippo hasn't been particularly good defensively at left back. I think it's definitely been a, a bit of a weakness, and and that was where the equaliser came from again on Saturday. I I just feel somebody said this to me when I was going out. Another journalist said. They're just not where they were last season. It feels like with a couple of exceptions, and Melier was, was brilliant again against West Ham, and Phillips not so good, but I feel like Phillips is a good start to the season. You take those two away, and it feels as if everybody else is just a little below where they were, um, isn't quite at, at the same level. I know that physically the stats are still as, as they were previously. There's no concern at the club at all um, about the physical output, but they can see themselves that the team are not playing playing as they can um, and I think that lends itself to to a run of six games without a win I feel like Firpo coming in from Barcelona has put a, an extra level of pressure on him to an extent I feel like if he'd come in from Sociedad or somewhere we'd be a bit more willing to give him time but there is that just having the name attached to it I think people expect as much as people did with if anyone's got a long memory Raul Bravo when he arrived for Real Madrid it was like oh we're getting a Real Madrid fullback he's going to be great and then he turned <laughs> up and you were like oh mm, mm. <laughs> it's not quite working I mean it's, it's early days from isn't it and it is, as you've said, with the, trying to learn the systems and things. It's just, it's just not quite sort of caught fire as you'd hope. You'd wanted to see him bombing up and down the left and laying on chances. And we need to stress as well. People probably don't realise just how little was going on at Barcelona when he was there. You know, they were training like an hour a day, weren't they? If that, and if you know, if it was raining outside and Lionel Messi didn't fancy getting wet, nobody trained. So um, he was some way down the pecking order and all that. And he's gone from that to the intensity of Leeds, where it's it's all or nothing. It's like a massive education, which sounds back to front. You would think it would be the other way round. And and I think the stuff about Messi in the rain and the shot training sessions is no joke it yeah. has been has been a culture culture change for him uh, I, there was an, an aspect of that with Casilla as well in, in the periods where he had poor games of people saying well this guy's supposed to be from from Real Madrid and and also left back was a priority for them and, and the whole narrative around that was that they were going to upgrade on on Alioski and and actually so far I don't think Firpo has contributed more than Alioski did generally in the Premier League. Alioski was pretty good. I think we all just felt that there, are, there were better left backs or perhaps more more natural left backs out there. Um, although like Bielsa was saying to us last week, you kind of don't have left backs anymore and you don't have left wingers. They're all sort of homogenous and, and the same thing. You know, you have to be able to do all of it. I, I think it is I think it is a pretty steep learning curve for for football. But he, he's up I was trying to think about Leeds after the game and, and you know, it was obviously a pretty depressing result and think about what it was that made Leeds good um, for so long under Bielsa and why they've been good for so long. And they're, they're a team who I always felt confident before every game that they could win it. And I knew that, that there were games that they probably wouldn't um, and there were games that they definitely didn't. But I think even when they lost and they, they lost heavily, even when they were like 4-0 down at Arsenal and 4-0 down at Manchester United, you, you always kind of wondered because they were still going at it and they were still causing problems. And there was this kind of like youthful defiance of, look, this is how we play and every every now and again we might t- catch one on, on the chin, but we don't care and, and it'll see us right. And it almost feels this season, certainly in these six games, like we've gone from a position where you, you can make an argument for Leeds winning any game to a position where they, they might just lose any game. And I thought they were worth a point against Everton, but I still think about that little period where Calvert-Lewin had his big chances. You know, the, the late goal dug them out of it at, at Burnley. Bit iffy in the second half against Newcastle and then again against West Ham from such a strong position, just going going backwards. I, I still think it's it's one win to, to spark this whole thing to life. And, and I, I don't think they're far away from that. But it's been, it's been difficult. A quick word on Adam Forshaw as well, who's been injured again. In the uh, in the run up to this, I feel really really sorry for him on a human level. And every time this happens, it gets harder and harder to see a way back from him uh, for him from this. I don't know how long you'll be out. I mean, Bielsa suggested it could be a month. Um, we'll I suspect we'll get another update on that today. He wasn't totally sure, but he was saying it was a tear to his, his thigh muscle or, or thereabouts, which. I repeat myself here, but it's not actually that unusual if you've been out for ages. This this does tend to happen. But that's almost immaterial when you're talking about a club who needs centre mids and, and a club who need him need him to be fit. And and you have to bear in mind as well that Forshaw's into the last year of his contract now. And, and if there is any chance of him staying beyond this year, th- there have surely got to be signs through this season that, that he's over the worst with his with his injuries and, and that he is 
you know, on the straight and narrow and unable to play for quite a, a sustained period. And again, when when he played against Crewe, I thought there was a lot about him that was was good, a lot about him that you could see fitting in nicely with, with the team. But it does become more and more difficult to know what, what sort of part he's going to play. Doesn't reflect well on uh, Andrea Radrizzani's tweet, does it? <laughs> No, and I I don't think that was particularly well advised at all. I don't think it's a good idea to keep that fight going either. I mean, it it just kind of applies pressure to Forshaw. It keeps the the focus on Forshaw. And I always try to say this to people. None of this is Forshaw's fault at all. It's not his fault that he's been injured for two years or that it's a, a struggle to get fit. It's most certainly not his fault that they didn't sign a centre mid over the summer um, or last summer either. You know, that is an area where they, they do need a player um, without any doubt and I think we all keep watching Conor Gallagher at Palace and thinking that would have been a really good fit you know I think he, he would have been a good signing for Leeds but they didn't get him they didn't get Lewis O'Brien um, they are short in that area and I, I felt on Saturday that you could almost see that the, the mid part of the reason that West Ham was starting to get on top was because the midfield were flagging and they needed fresh legs in there but there wasn't really an option that was going to change the game I'm a little bit not confused, I kind of understand why it's happened, but in your absence earlier in the summer when we had Victor Orta and he was saying, you know, they've always got three targets for every position and I'm still at a slight loss as to understand why they didn't manage to secure a central midfielder and I know this argument is going to come up every time we lose a game and I understand that and I'm probably part of the problem, but you can't help but think we need a central midfielder just to give us an option. I can only really speak about Gallagher and O'Brien and the, the issue with Gallagher was that Leeds wanted him but he wanted to play regularly and he wasn't likely to start here, not to begin with anyway. Um, uh, being at Palace meant he could stay in London and he just felt that that was, that was the right move for him um, in the end. I was a little bit surprised but I suppose when you think about it like that and when you look at how much he has played, um, it's, it's not necessarily been a, a bad decision so far. And then with O'Brien, it, it was a case of Bielsa saying again, you know, I like this guy, I really like him, but, you know, to begin with, he's not going to be first choice. Leeds finding out the valuation from Huddersfield and, and them all agreeing on mass that it didn't make sense to spend that money on somebody who, who wasn't going to be so involved and, and somebody who, you know, let, let, let's face it with O'Brien, if Leeds do carry on on a, a, you know, a decent trajectory upwards, is he going to be good enough a little bit further down the line for what they hope to be doing, which is Europa League football and, and everything else? I don't know. So perhaps you'd, you'd have paid the but money we need, for but him. But we need, we need to stay up first, Phil. Uh, but but that, I think that is what everybody is starting to come to realise now, is that it's fine talking about Europe um, in three years' time. I mean, Radrizani, after the Liverpool game, was on Sky talking about that again. And, and it it does feel as if it's... It's, it's it's fine to discuss it in a broader sense and, you know, in a quite abstract way of, look, this is where we, we would like to go. But I don't think it has much relevance at the moment when you're trying to get an individual season going and, and when it does need to get going. And I, as I say, I, I looked at that performance on Saturday and in those closing stages, I did think a pair of legs, that, that bringing on a pair of legs of a hardened, you know, proven central midfielder, doesn't need to be old, doesn't need to be vastly experienced, but somebody who's who'd kind of been around the block a little bit at this level or close to this level would surely have, have made a difference. And the bench continues to be very, very weak. And, and that is in part because these injury problems, selection problems keep coming at them. But that's not really the issue in in the centre of midfield. The issue in the centre of midfield is that they didn't sign anybody. Do you think if Ailing was fit, we might be seeing Jamie Shackleton in there? Possibly, yeah. I mean, I, I thought Shackleton had a good game down at Fulham, I think Shackleton more often than not does have a good game when he plays and he kind of gets forgotten a bit in this discussion, doesn't he? And I think that is because he he, he drops in at right back, he gets the odd chance at, at in the centre of midfield but often as a substitute and then can disappear for a little bit of game because he's not you know, he's not at the front of the queue he has to be a, an option really um, and he, he feels to me at the moment more of an option than Forshaw because the thing with Shackleton, and Shackleton does suffer from injuries but the thing with Shackleton is that you expect him to be available more. 